and I call this home run. I do a knockoff of my dad's call of we'll see you tomorrow night. And, uh, and I won the Emmy for that year, which I literally won an Emmy for one call. And it was a call that wasn't even original. I did a ripoff of my dad's call that happened 20 years earlier. Otherwise the rest of the year was not only not Emmy worthy, I probably should have lost my job. First of all, this is my voice. I'm Tim Green, and I have ALS. This podcast is not about ALS or living with disabilities. I don't want you to feel sorry for me. I don't feel sorry for me. I am a father of five with a marriage that's lasted for over 33 years. I am a number one New York Times best-selling author of 41 books, an NFL first-round pick with an eight-year career. I worked on TV for Fox Sports, Good Morning America, Court TV, and Extra. I've hosted BattleBots, A Current Affair, and Find My Family. And I am also a practicing attorney. In this podcast, we're diving into real-life stories. From triumphs to trials, we'll explore the extraordinary in the ordinary. Join me, Tim Green, and my son, Troy, each week for real conversations, laughter, and insights. Because life is a journey, and everyone's got a story. Dive into today's podcast episode with the exceptional Joe Buck, a voice that shaped the soundtrack of American sports. Joe, a master storyteller and seasoned sportscaster, brings a blend of insight, charm, and wit to our show. Known for his iconic calls in NFL and MLB's most electric moments, Joe's narrative skill turns every tale of the game into an edge of your seat adventure. From thrilling World Series finales to unforgettable Super Bowl showdowns, Joe has been the guiding voice through sports history's most pulse-pounding moments. But beyond the microphone, he's a man of depth and humor, ready to share stories that span from the broadcasting booth to personal reflections on legacy and life. Whether you're a diehard sports fan or a newcomer to the magic of game day narratives, Prepare for an episode that's as engaging as Joe Buck's legendary game day calls. So grab your headphones, settle in, and let's welcome Joe Buck to the stage for a conversation you won't want to miss. My voice in today's episode is powered by Eleven Labs. Joe Buck is an eight-time Emmy Award winner, the face of Monday Night Football, along with Troy Aikman, an NFL Football Hall of Fame inductee, along with his father, Jack Buck, the only father-son broadcasting duo in the Hall of Fame. I had the extreme pleasure of being Joe's very first NFL Network broadcast partner. Joe, thank you so much for joining us today. Are you kidding me? This is an honor. It's so good to see your face. It's so good to interact with you and Troy. It's, uh, I guess, I was thinking today, I guess I just do my best work with either people named Troy or people named Tim. <laughs> I get Troy Green on here. I got Troy Aikman on NFL games. I had Tim Green as my first football partner and my first network TV partner, and I worked with Tim McCarver for 18 years doing baseball. So I'm very comfortable with my partners today being Troy and Tim. That may, it makes me smile. We planned that out. That's that was, this was a whole long, it was 30 it's years a long ago. play. I mean, how old are you, Troy? That's a long play to make this thing happen. At 29. Jeez. Almost 30. Wow. Well, I've got daughters that are, uh, 27 and one that is 24. They're living in New York. And then five-year-old twin boys who uh, wow. are going to get out of school in the next couple of hours and just devour my night. So I'm happy to talk to you two guys right now. <laughs> Joe, I mentioned just a few of your many awards. Did I miss anything? What's the thing that you are most proud of? I think, I think when it comes down to it, I'm most proud of what I said a minute ago on my end. I mean, the work stuff is fine and it's great and it's a great way to make a living. And I love it today as much as I did when you and I were together in 94 and 95. And I, I don't think any of that excitement for going to work uh, will ever disappear. 
but I'm most proud of, of who I am or what I try to be as a dad, what I try to be as a husband, what I try to be as a brother, as a son. Um, you know, you two guys are doing what I, I was a big part of, uh, on the younger end with my dad and, and honoring my father and, and being somebody that, uh, learned from a great human being, not a great broadcaster. Yes, that, that was a part of it. Just like you were a great football player, announcer, writer, all that other stuff, but great person and somebody who's made the world better with, with them being in it. So I, I think what I'm most proud of is, is hopefully if you were to have my daughters and eventually my sons, if they could sit still for more than four seconds <laughs> and you asked them who their best friend was, Hopefully the answer would be me. And uh, I, I, I feel like that's the case with my daughters. Um, and I, I'm trying to build that with my sons uh, as I climb that mountain again. But I, that, that's the stuff that, and, and I think I learned that, not to go on and on, but I, I learned that watching my dad's career and life arc and, and seeing a guy that was so celebrated publicly, especially here in St. Louis, but uh, seeing somebody who treated people the right way. And when he passed away um, with a number of things, I mean, Parkinson's and diabetes and a pacemaker. And I mean, he couldn't get off a ventilator and was, was going through all kinds of hell. He was still trying to help people while he was in the hospital, uh, raising money for Matthew's Dickey boys and girls clubs, uh, doing things that made the world better. And, and that was what I was most proud of when he passed away. And uh, it wasn't, you know, a home run call that he made on an Ozzie Smith home run. That stuff is fine and good, but that's not what's important. Joe, would you say, was your dad your best friend? Without a doubt. Um, he was, and, and it's a complicated answer because I came along at a time when he was an older father. He was in his mid forties, like I was when, when my boys were born, I was in my late forties. Um, but I, I think he was ready to be a better dad and a more involved dad than he was with his first six kids. And so my timing has always been really f fortunate. I, I think it was right with, um, with when I came along in his life that, that he, wanted, he wanted me in the room with him. And, and I thought about that. I spoke to a father and son group three weeks ago, and I was thinking a lot about my dad. And what I settled on was, the greatest gift that he gave me was letting me know, even at a young age, that he wanted me around. He wanted me in the room with him when he was interviewing people. He wanted me on the road with him. He wanted me in the Cardinals team charter. <coughs> Excuse me. He, he wanted me to learn from him. And, and so he was traveling a lot. But when I was a kid, it kept me on the straight and narrow because I didn't want to be grounded. I didn't want to be in trouble. He was home you know, let's say two weeks out of a month. And I didn't want those two weeks wasted with me being in trouble. So yes, he was my best friend. He knew that he was my best friend and, and I think vice versa. I'm sure there's a hundred things that you could probably say, but is there one thing in particular that he did with you that you try to do with your kids? Yeah. I, I, is there anything that I try to do um, to, to let my kids know that that was your question, right? Yeah. I think with my girls, I, I always had that like internal clock where I felt like if I was traveling a lot and it was piling up, um, I made sure that I either eliminated a day on the beginning or end of it, or I just took them with me. And, you know, it wasn't always possible the older that they got, but I think they knew that it was important to me to do the same thing that I just said my dad did for me. So I, I just, I wanted them to know that they were always welcome and it didn't always fit into their lives. I mean, they had their own lives going on. And I think that's part of growing up as a parent too, is you realize sometimes you take a back seat. Sometimes you're not the apple of their eye and they've got a boyfriend or they've got a big dance they want to go to, or they got a something that they, that they want to be a part of. And there, you got to be willing to step back and do it with a smile on your face. But I, I think the main thing is just letting them know that, 
You know, I wanted them in the booth with me. I wanted them in the hotel room with me. I, wa- I wanted them a part of my world. And, and that was what I learned from my dad. And I think, you know, even from a very young age, um, my girls knew that if it was getting like, where the heck's dad? It's been forever. Um, I was either going to try and shave a day off somewhere or I was going to just grab them and take them with me. That's awesome. Yeah. I remember my dad used to, he used to take like the red eye when you guys were not literally when you guys were announcing together, he would take the red eye home that night and we wouldn't even know. I mean, he'd be gone like the minimum, minimum days possible. I learned a lot of that from your dad. And, and I, your dad is one of the few people and we're acting like we're talking like he's not, in the room (laughs) uh tim you are one of the few people in my life that you know you set a standard that i tried to live by you you were the guy that pissed me off because when i when i would go to like the nfl seminar and we would have it in la your dad was so disciplined tim you were so disciplined that you would stay on east coast time because you were i think you were studying for the bar at that time and you were writing books and you were learning how to broadcast. I mean, that was such a crazy time for your dad and me. And Tim, you know, you were just off the field. And I was a handful of years into my broadcast career, but I had never done football, let alone the NFL. And Tim and I are sitting there in Soldier Field in Chicago, week one of the 1994 season, like, what in the hell are we doing? It's like mom and dad are gone and it's like risky business. We have the keys to the Porsche and we're going to go drown the Porsche in Lake Michigan. Uh, and, and in this case, it was just end everything that Fox had built up with all the money that they had invested because your dad's trying to figure out how to broadcast and I'm trying to figure out how to do the NFL. And I'd never done anything of that magnitude And But it just worked. And it was so cool that he and I got to audition together. And then they liked us enough after our audition, I assume, that they just kept us together. That was not the case with, obviously, a lot of the people that came through L.A. in the spring of 94. Uh, But I was fortunate that the guy that I got to know, I was like, I really like that guy. Uh, Because he and I, Tim, I, I don't know if you remember, but you and I went to Denny's after we did our audition and we sat this is going to blow your mind, but we sat at a table talking about the audition that we did. If we thought we got the job, what it would be like. <laughs> and then I, I knew, I knew Tim, you were a hundred times smarter than me. I just by your resume and everything else that you'd done, but I was an English major at Indiana your dad was far and away more advanced in the world of, in the literature world. And your dad wrote, I just found this in my desk. I've had it ever since wrote on a piece of paper. Let me see if I can get it so that it, I don't know if it's kind of blurry as I hold it up. Is that, there you go. That's awesome. So I was like, well, Tim, you know, do you have any good books that, uh, that, the dumb Joe could read that are, that are interesting? And he wrote this boy, this boy's life back in the world, the barracks thief by Tobias Wolf, blood Meridian, all the pretty horses by Cormac McCarthy cathedral. Uh, will you be quiet, please from Raymond Carver, 100 years of solitude, love in the time of cholera, cholera. I don't even know how to pronounce it by Gabriel Garcia Marquez. I will have, you know, I didn't read one of those books, <laughs> not one. But I walked out of there and I I kept this like I I have this list of like smart guy books and I kept it in my in my wallet and I have never gotten rid of it. It's I've the stuff that I have gotten rid of. It's a long list, but that has been with me and will be with me uh, for as long as I'm on this earth. Oh, that's incredible. Dad, do you remember that that Denny's interaction? For sure. Troy, you better say I'm your best friend too. <laughs> <laughs> you were the best. You were the best man at my wedding. Of course, you're my best friend. Oh, the, my dad was the best man at my wedding. So there you go. Proof positive, Tim, that uh, you did something right there. 
Yeah, and it probably says something, Joe, about you and I not having a lot of friends. But we'll we'll let's go with the positive. We'll go with yeah, the positive, exactly. Positive. No, I think you're right. <laughs> I I was the dorky kid, like broadcasting games into a tape recorder when I was. I start looking back, and people are like, "When did you get into broadcasting?" And like, well, the minute I figure out who my dad was and the access I had, and I would sit in an empty booth at Bush Stadium broadcasting games and like, well, when did you do that? And I was like, I don't know, 13, 14, 15 years old. And then the other part of me is like, why was I not with friends doing stuff? Instead, I'm, I'm just with daddy doing games into a tape recorder. But that's the way it goes. I had the pleasure of getting to know your dad a little bit. He was a legend, but he was as nice and kind as my own grandfather. I know he meant the world to you. And anyone could see that you meant the world to him. How much of the X's and O's of broadcasting did he teach you? And do you think that great announcing is a hereditary trait at all? Yeah, I I think about this all the time because I I think it's more nurture than nature for me. Um, I I think there's some genetic component to it, uh, but I think because I grew up in the Cardinals broadcast booth, literally, uh, I think that's how I learned to broadcast and and you have to remember i mean i from the time i i can remember i was in the cardinals radio broadcast booth which was the best seat in the house i sat down by the time i got old enough to really be able to be trusted to be quiet i was on the same level and row as my dad and mike shannon his longtime partner i had a like almost half a set of headphones and earphone over my right ear that I could hold up. I'd look to my left, two seats over is my dad. One seat over is, is a legendary Cardinal player. The game is right there. And that is how I grew up. I sat in that booth night after night, year after year, watching my dad put his lineups down, do his interviews, interact with players and, and watched all that and took it in. I mean, I, I have seven brothers and sisters and I don't, everybody kind of had the same access, but I think I was the the one that was just glued to whatever he was doing. And, and so to answer the first part of your question, Tim, I, I think, you know, he, he was, he was genuinely a nice person. And, and I just watched him walk into the ballpark night after night. You know, he was a depression era kid. He didn't grow up with any money in his pocket the minute he got some, he wanted to give it away to everybody that, that was came in his, into his path. I mean, concet, concession workers, the elevator operator, anybody, if he had any walking around money, as he called it, he was handing it out left and right. He was just a great guy. And, and those first couple years, Tim, that you and I were together, I, I, I relied on him not only to give me feedback on our broadcast, but to give us feedback on our broadcast. So he would watch our games. He'd be like, tell Tim, he's got to make that point and just make the point and just move on. You don't need to make the point, remake the point and then give a conclusion. Just, you made the point and just move on. And, and so he had a very keen ear with what he was listening to. And, and to wrap this part of the question up before I showed up in LA for that rehearsal or that audition, I sat, in his living room during spring training in Florida. And I, he and I watched a game off of videotape. This is how long this ago this was. Uh, and this is spring of 94. Watched a game that he had Channel 4 in St. Louis send him. It was a Saints game. It was Bobby Bear was the quarterback. And I'm watching the game and I'm in the living room and my dad is being the color analyst with me and I'm calling the play-by-play now I had done the Cardinals for four years at that point, but I, I I had no idea really the timing, what I was supposed to be saying on TV as I'm being the as I'm trying to be the broadcaster. And so he was that's the only time he really went through the nuts and bolts of what to do. Cause I was overdoing everything. I'm like, three receivers to the right, uh Pierre Thomas or whoever the running back was in the backfield tight end is set over to the left side. He's like, stop. You don't need any of that. You don't need it's TV. You wait, wait till the snap and say, a bear, a bear looks to throw and completes it to whoever. So that, that was probably the most hands-on that he ever was. The rest of it, I just got by kind of watching. It's funny. Even hearing you say that now, it sounded like, 
that's <laughs> like even yeah. just that you just drop back to throw i'm like it's uh, i had like a uh, nostalgia to, to watch well i can game. do my dad's voice the older i get i mean i i still freak my mom out who's 84 and you know, she just still, still, you know, just misses my dad so much. And every once in a while, she'll pay, I'll call her, she'll pick up the phone and I'll do my dad's voice. I'll be like, hello, Blondie, how you doing? And she's, it takes her a second, like, wait, it, oh, no, he's been gone for 20 plus years. But uh, yeah, I, I, I can do my dad's voice. And, and I think, uh, you know, I, I think the one thing I did when I was a kid and, and got into this, and I say kid when I was 21, 22, 23 years old, is I got into it and didn't try to sound like him. I just tried to find my own voice, find my own style, my own rhythm. It's it's 90% a rip off of my dad, but there's at least 10% of myself in there, uh, whatever that is. And, and that's just kind of how I went about it. Joe, when we were partners, you treated me to the best of St. Louis workout steam and my first massage at the Missouri Athletic Club, Carl's for lunch where we had the best cheeseburgers and root beer in the world and rounded off by dinner at Tony's and a blues hockey game. What a great time. My question to you is this, has Troy Aikman gotten this treatment yet? No. So when, when Tim came to St. Louis, I mean, I took your dad... Tim, I took you to the best that St. Louis has to offer. As you said, yes, Blues games, uh, dinner at Tony's, great. We had a great time. Somehow your dad who, you know, Tim, you have the the uh, metabolism of a hummingbird. You, like, would eat a gigantic dinner and lose weight. I'd eat a gigantic dinner and gain weight for two of us. But, uh, yeah, I, 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 I Troy has been great with coming into town, but – he would never go to a blues game with me. That would never happen. He just wouldn't do it. He'd be out of town before if we had an event during the day, he'd be like, all right, we're done at four wheels up at five o'clock. And there wouldn't be any lingering uh, with, there's no lingering with Troy Aikman. So uh, I gave your dad, Tim, I took you, as you know, because I sent you a picture of it the other day to Carl's drive in in St. Louis on Manchester road where I think they, as much as your dad and Tim, you love this place. They were more in awe of the volume of food that your dad could consume. That's right. Uh, and so his picture was up on the wall. My dad's picture was up on the wall in this place because every time he walked in, whatever side of the restaurant, it's a sit down stool place where you walk in either door A or door B on the other side of, of the kitchen, which is right in front of you. You sit on stools and whatever side he walked in, he bought everybody's lunch on that side. So they loved him. They love when my dad showed up. I bring Tim in there. Tim's pictures on the wall. Is my picture on the wall? No. My dad's <laughs> pictures on the wall. Tim Green's pictures on the wall. Not me. Is that place still around? Oh yeah. Yeah. I took my boys there the other day for the first time. I sent your dad a picture of us sitting in there. Uh, and he's right. I mean, <laughs> It's IBC root beer right out of this gigantic keg that is freezing cold uh, root beer. And then uh, they make root beer floats that my boys were just in awe of. And, and so, Tim, you too. When we went to the Blues hockey game, you told me they were the best professional athletes to deal with. As a rule, they were humble. Hockey, then football, baseball, then basketball. Has that order changed at all in the past 25 years? Also, is that why you are a Blues season ticket holder? Yeah, I, I love those guys. And I've become, you know, dear friends with the, the players that played here in St. Louis, the Brett Hulls, uh, Chris Pronger. I mean, two are my, they're two of my very best friends. And my daughter, Trudy, uh, dated a player who played for the Arizona Coyotes for four years, now plays for the Red Wings, named Christian Fisher. They're no longer together. But, I mean, if it, your daughter dates an NHL player, it's, it's, it's a good choice because they, they have discipline. You know, they, they are they're great guys. They play for one another. Um, they're tough. But I think they're nurturing. I, 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 they're just good teammates. So I, I think yes. I, I'm, I've always been a big fan of of guys that played in the NHL. Um, and you know, then you can rank the next the next three any way you want. But I, there's something about 
a hockey player with kind of the grit determination and, and the, the way that they play for one another, it's, you know, no matter what happens, it's like stitch me up and let me get back out there. So I'm, I'm a big fan of that mentality, which I know you are too, Tim. I've become quite a hockey fan. I should say a Rangers fan. Our daughter Tate met a player named Adam Fox at Harvard. The first night I met him, I thought of you and what you said about hockey players. He was pleasant, quiet, and humble. He still is, even though he won the Norris Trophy in only his second year in the league, matched only by Bobby Orr. They're getting married this summer, not Bobby Orr and Adam, Tate and Adam. <laughs> that is am- I had no idea. Uh, I thought, it sounded like, Joe, it sounded like you were setting it up. That's I thought you must have known. I didn't know that. No, that's unbelievable. I mean, talk of, that's crazy. Um, yeah, I... You know, I well, you know better than I. I'm not. I shouldn't be telling you anything. You're you're about to give away a daughter to to an NHL player. I first I was going to say, well, that's just a humble brag because that means that your kid went to Harvard, uh, <laughs> and that's why you're bringing it up. But that's great news. Congratulations. I know he's a hell of a player. I know you mentioned it earlier, and from your beautiful holiday card that you have two beautiful twin boys, Blake and Wyatt, who are almost six years old. Do you take them to the hockey games in the ballpark? I saw them at a Monday night game this fall with you. You guys looked like you were having so much fun. Yeah, um, there, it's, it's really cool to be able to do this again with another set of kids. Um, you know, I was an empty nester for about four seconds, and then I got back into the game. And now here I am with little kids in the broadcast booth again. Um, it's it's really special and yes it's funny you asked me this because we're going to the blues game i'm taking them uh on saturday the blues are playing uh the minnesota wild my wife's family's from minnesota but blake white and joe will be rooting for the st louis blues and then we've got the cardinals opening day coming up um and uh we're going to that so i i you know i i've i feel like and and you can use this against me someday. We're talking on February 28th, 2024. <clears throat> I have a boy in Blake whose dream right now is to play either defensive back in the NFL, although he's got the body like dad. So he'll be up front uh, on the defensive line. Uh, and then a boy, Wyatt, who we were playing in the park yesterday and My boys joined this game. Blake played. He's five. He's playing with eight-year-olds, like a pickup football game. It was like mind-blowing because that's how I grew up, playing pickup football games in a yard. This was like out on a lawn in a park. And then Wyatt wants nothing to do with that. He wanted to go to the playground and show me that he could climb this ladder and swing over to this uh fire pole and slide down and he's like the performer he's like mom blake is like me it's it's amazing how different they are and they're ivf babies uh they're so they're twins and that they were born at the same time but there was no like splitting of of eggs or any of that stuff they are their own individual people and one's big one's small one's you know, kind of a weepy kid in in a good way, sweet and kind of cute and cuddly. And the other one's just just right through the wall. Um, they they just couldn't be more different. And and as as I sit here, I think I've got one kid that wants to be like a Disney kid, and one kid that wants to uh, to play for the whatever. I'll say the Atlanta Falcons in your honor. <laughs> okay. So you have announced five different sports by my count: baseball football, horse racing, golf, and bass fishing. Did I miss anything? You missed six. Uh, basketball. I did college basketball. Um, but yeah, bass fishing, I don't know that that... I did it. You could also add Robbie Knievel jumping over limousines in a parking lot in Vegas, live on national TV. But I, I, I will accept five. That's That's a good number. Uh, but bass fishing and live television should never be in the same sentence because you realize about 20 minutes into the hour and a half broadcast, 
that if these fish decide that between 4.30 and 6 p.m. Eastern on that very day that they're not going to bite, you don't have a show. So uh, that's why all of the fishing shows, the Bill Dance shows from back in our childhood, were all recorded, edited, put together. Because I went through an hour and a half of a live bass fishing show on the lakes of Orlando, Florida, on Fox. Uh, I did it with Bob Brenly and uh, and a guy named Forrest Wood, sweetest man of all time, guy who invented the modern day bass boat. And we are fumbling our way through this live broadcast, and there are no fish biting whatsoever. So it was uh, was really fun. That tested everything I had with how to fill an hour and a half. That was 90 minute show and if the show was 91 minutes it would have been one minute of silence because i thought of everything i could think of in 90 minutes to try to fill dead air is there anything out of the stuff you have announced is there i, I, I would guess football is your favorite but maybe not what, what's your favorite uh thing to announce yeah it's it's, it's football and baseball i i think they're very different they're like my boys they're like you know all, all your brothers and how many, what do you have? How many brothers and sisters? I've got two brothers and two sisters. Okay. So with regard to baseball and football, baseball for a play-by-play guy has so much room in it that you can do a lot of different stuff, even on TV. You can talk about who's up in the bullpen. You can talk about who's left on the bench. You can talk about the size of the crowd. You can, Because now there is a pitch clock, but when I was doing it, there's no pitch clock. The games take a long time, but for me as the play-by-play guy, I loved it because there was a lot of room in there to kind of go different directions, you know, talk with the analyst. Most of the time it was Tim McCarver or John Smoltz and, and kind of talk strategy and do all that. It's, It's a blast. Football on the other side, on the other hand, is massive. I mean, 130 million people watched this past Super Bowl plus, and there's just nothing like it. So doing a Super Bowl is, it's scary, it's fun, it's exciting, but it's also a little treacherous because you know you're doing a game that the entire world is watching. Uh, so it's just, it's apples and oranges. I, I I love the room in baseball to kind of use my mind and mm-hmm. and kind of explore different stuff, but but football is just so ridiculously huge. There's just no feeling like, like, welcoming people to a Super Bowl, which I've had to, I've gotten to do six times. Is there any event or a sport you haven't announced that you, <clears throat> you'd like to try or wish you had the opportunity to try? Yeah, I, I really, there's nothing, you know, people go, well, would you like to call the Olympics? I mean, yeah, if you can implant in me all the research that it requires to do <laughs> These events that, you know, I, I, I'm not going to, I have no idea. Maybe you guys do because of where you live, but I've never seen a bobsled race yeah, in yeah. with my lives, uh, with my own eyes. I, I, so there's a lot of work. I'm, I'm not a track and field guy. I'm not, I mean, if, if I did an Olympics and I called a baseball game in the Olympics, sure. I mean, that'd be fun. But, you know, I think I'm at the point in my life in my mid fifties now where, I'm looking to kind of pare things down. I, I've got one girl about to get married. Another girl's working hard, as I said, in New York, and then two little boys. And and I think the more that I'm around and available, that's more fulfilling to me, knowing all the while that I get to do this incredible job on and love every second of doing Monday nights, but I'm not looking to add, and there's nothing that I go, man, I just wish I could call the NBA All-Star game. I, it's just, that's... It's not on my radar. And no, and by the way, most importantly, nobody's asking me to do that. So I, we're good. <laughs> Joe, did you have a favorite call that you, you've had a couple of iconic moments throughout your career that you've called any, anything jump out as like a favorite or, or one that's, I think it's more, more, I think it's more the situation. It's not like, Oh my God, I nailed that call. It's more, where was I? What was going on in life? How hard was it to kind of put the nerves aside um, and and do my and do my job? I, I think the answer to that question is more situational and not what I said. Like I can give you four or five examples of ones that when I hear it, I don't cringe. That's kind of my that's my threshold. Like there's about four or five, and I'm like, oh, that was good. 
but there's none that I'm like, oh my God, I was so awesome. I, it's yeah. the ones where I go, oh my God, that stunk. I, I don't ever want to hear that again, but I have to because it's on YouTube or whatever it is. But I, I think it would be the 1996 World Series, which I was 27 and scared out of my wits. Um, and, you know, calling the Yankees winning a World Series in the Bronx was, uh, I can't even say a lifetime goal. It was a thrill of a lifetime, but I never thought I would do it. I, I never thought in those terms. The Minneapolis Miracle, which was the Stefan Diggs touchdown, yeah. was, uh, I mean, rare is it that you get a walk-off touchdown? Sure, but that, we that got one. one. Yeah, in, in a in a crazy playoff game with the home team winning and the place going nuts. Uh, Plexigo Burris with a touchdown for the Giants in Super Bowl Forty Two, uh, and and that crazy game that was just so intense. Yeah, uh, and back and forth, and you're doing a Super Bowl. Uh, those those are the one. Mark McGuire hitting a sixty second home run, breaking the Roger Maris record um, that had stood. Since 1961, and and you know, hitting number 62 was was something that I'll never forget. And I was glad it went as well as it did. Those are the ones, but it, but it's not because I was awesome. It was just because the oh, moment was so big, and I felt like I did my job and matched the moment instead of detracting from it. I got to ask you because you brought it up. What's what do you think your most cringe cringe worthy one is, or what's one that that Whatever, well, there. I mean, there. I, I can't say there are a lot. I'm not going to beat myself up, but I. There's one that they just did a retrospective of my baseball career on MLB Network, which I was really flattered and honored to see, watch, and hear, and all. I was so fun to be able to show my girls and my boys. They watched for about 13 seconds. Um, in in 2006. The Cardinals beat the Detroit Tigers in the World Series. Mm -hmm. And you're always in baseball when you do the national game. You're always accused of rooting against both teams because baseball fans hear the home announcer doing the TV game all year long. And then you show up and you're doing the World Series when they care the most. And now the other team hits a home run and you've got to scream and yell and get excited. <laughs> while they're throwing stuff at the TV. And during the course of the season, when the other team hits a home run, their announcers, they're paid to to make everybody excited about the team. They're sad. They, they don't want to they don't want to see or call the home run that just put their team, you know, down in the game. Fine, so yeah. in, in 2006, I took the bait. And I, I had a friend who played on the PGA tour who talked to, and I won't name the announcer, but it was a broadcaster who, who was a Tigers fan. And he said, you know, it's just a shame they let a St. Louis guy call the Cardinals and Tigers in the World Series because he's obviously rooting for St. Louis. And I was like, okay, you know I'm not. That's ridiculous. But it's my team that I grew up watching. My dad's face is on the outfield wall as one of the people that's been retired, in essence, by the organization. And I'm trying to be as impartial as I can and I was, I heard that criticism from somebody in the business that was a Tigers fan. And I thought, man, if that guy doesn't get it and he thinks I'm rooting for the Cardinals, then I really got to go the other way. And I hear them win the 2006 World Series. And my voice is so flat and so monotone and so not excited because I'm trying to prove to everybody in Detroit and this person in particular, I'm not rooting for the Cardinals. Look, here's the most boring home or most boring call ever to end a world series. It just, it was, it was a good learning moment for me because I heard it back. I was like, man, that's just not fair. That's not fair to fans in St. Louis. That's not, it's not about me. I'm, if people want to give me trouble or they want to say you're rooting for the other side, I never am. But they hear with their own ears and they hear what they want to hear. So so it was it was a it was a life lesson. It was a broadcasting lesson for me. And I feel like I never took that bait again where it affected how I actually called the game. And it was kind of Twitter before Twitter. I don't think Twitter was around in 2006, but it, it got in my head. And mm -hmm. and, you know, I'm sad that it did because it was the Cardinals first World Series in 
over two decades and and the guy calling it on tv who grew up rooting for the cardinals went so far the other way that's just not a good call you gave up announcing baseball could you ever have imagined in your youth giving up baseball no no and and it it's kind of along the lines of what i just talked about there's an element of that where it's like i i I miss people go, do you miss calling baseball? I did it for 35 years. That, that like is a lifetime in broadcasting. So I, I, I feel like I put my time in, I feel like, you know, I did 24 world series. That's a lot. I mean, that's, that's way more. It's about 24 more than I ever expected to do on national television. So I, what I do miss is calling the game for the home crowd. I do miss the local stuff where you go into the booth and you're the Cardinal announcer and the Cardinals win. Yay. The Cardinals lose boo. When you do the network stuff and you get all that stuff, it's like death by a thousand cuts. It's you hate my team. Screw you. Uh, all that stuff. And it just gets in your head. It it kind of takes a little bit of the fun out of it. And it's kind of just the way social media works. And, and I get all that now. And I, I can't act like I go home and cry myself to sleep every night. But I don't miss the stress that comes with all that. I do miss calling baseball for the Cardinals or if I lived in Denver for the Rockies or for the, you know, whoever, for the Yankees, for the Dodgers, doesn't matter. It's, it's kind of that mentality in baseball. It's different than the NFL where you show up, you're there for not just an organization, but for their fans and you're kind of rooting along with them. That, that's fun. And and so I missed that. But as far as the national stuff, I, I don't miss a lot of that. Joe, you've interviewed thousands of athletes, maybe even tens of thousands. Is there anyone that sticks out above the rest? The reason I ask is that I have someone that haunts me to this very day. It's Mark Brunel, the great quarterback for the Jacksonville Jaguars at the time. He had this complete equanimity that I envied for decades. He was a devout, born-again Christian which is what he attributed his inner peace to. Well, when I was diagnosed with ALS, I wanted to make sense of the feelings I had, fear, anger, depression. I finally followed him down that path and I've never felt so great, even though I have this nightmare of a disease. Anyway, have you had one athlete that you just cannot forget, good or bad? Yes. I mean, I, I'll say that it's, it, first of all, that that's, that's special to hear that about Mark Brunel and, and what that's provided you. And, um, I'm, I'm, I'm so thankful for that for you. Um, really for anybody, but, but for you in particular, and, and I will say this, people think that athletes are, you know, overpaid, uninteresting, not friendly people. I, I could name the bad ones that I've interacted with on less than one hand. It just, I, most people that I've met in professional sports, it's hard to succeed in a team game. And, and I mostly do team games, team sports, and, and just not be a, not be a good guy at your core, not understanding the way people fit together and interact for the greater good. And I, so I just haven't met a lot of those guys. And the guy, the one guy that I met that was not very friendly to me when I was a young guy has kind of said, you know, I really wasn't a nice guy when I was a player. Barry, I'm talking about Barry Bonds, who, you know, I, I, who knows what he was going through? Who knows how he looked at somebody from the media? But, you know, I, he's now, I think, has, has looked back on, on his time in the big leagues and gun. You know, I could have been a nicer person to – to some people. And, and, you know, I, I never expect, or it shouldn't be expected that anybody, you know, needs to, or has to talk to me. If I walk up with a microphone, sometimes you don't know what you're catching them. It could be catch them in a bad mood. They're having a bad day. They're having trouble at home. They've got a sick kid. They're doing whatever. Everybody's got their own life. And, and I, I understand that. And I think the older you get, the more appreciation you have for that kind of stuff to answer your question. Uh, there, there's two that stand out to me and, and there are many more that I could name, but I, I won't bore you with it. But I, I did this show on direct TV and it's all over YouTube. You, I mean, you can find it on YouTube. It's called, called undeniable. And I did 50 interviews 
they were two, sometimes three hours of people's life, people's lives, people's careers, their high points, their low points. I talked to Michael Phelps and, and it's the one, he's the guy that stands out to me because he had tasted so much success and yet was so fragile and was willing to be fragile, not just on TV, but in front of a live studio audience. And, and I, I, I knew him a little bit because I'd met him down in Mexico uh, at a resort. And so I knew him a little and I went in to, to see him beforehand. And uh, he said, you better be ready tonight because I'm, I'm going to lay it all out there. And I was like, wow, OK. So we talked about and this is by now ancient history. But when, you know, the bong picture that got out um what he dealt with. He's been, he, I think he's had two DWIs, him going into rehab, forced rehab, what it was like when he walked into the cafeteria at the rehabilitation place and he sat down, and they'd taken his phone and everything else. And he sat in the cafeteria and he looked up on the wall and there was the American flag and how many times he had seen that American flag raised in the Olympics and, you know, been so overwhelmed with joy that he'd won a race. And now here he is just stripped of everything with, with no phone, no ability to even walk out of the cafeteria, um, you know, even walk out of the facility because he was there to try to get his life right. Um, the way he, he knew the person that released the picture of him with the bong at the party and how people wanted him to sue that person. And he didn't go after that person, just the, the vulnerability, like I, so people would always ask me, you know, who's, who's a interview guest that you'd love to have. And it's like, I mean, I can give you a great list, Tiger Woods, Michael Jordan, all that stuff's great. But if they're not willing to be genuine or they're not willing to be vulnerable or they're not willing to be honest, I really don't care to, to bother with it. But when they would come there and they would be willing to talk like Michael Phelps was, he's the one of the 50 that I walked out of there like, wow, that was powerful. And, and, you know, at the end of it, we put a picture of Michael up on the screen. And again, this is in front of a, a audience of people. And it's the picture that was on sports illustrated with his 20 plus gold medals around his neck. And I said, what do you see when you see that picture? What do you, what does it make you think? And he said, I see an awkward guy with a different kind of smile and big ears. And I said, hmm, because the rest of the world sees 22 gold medals. Right. And he said, well, I was born, I was told I was born to try to keep my parents together and they got divorced. I was born and I have these ears and I got made fun of on the playground when I was a kid. And that's what I see. And it just shows you that everybody, I don't care what level of success you've had, the notoriety, the fame, the money, the whatever, everybody's just a person trying to get along on the earth. And, and, and it just was just so, I, it, was, it was an awakening for me that, you know, I was a fat kid, me personally, fat kid growing up on the playground, getting made fun of, you know, people always trying to knock you down. That stuff never leaves you. That stuff, it, you've always got that little voice going on in your head that just always giving you doubts and always giving you, and everybody, I think, deals with that stuff. So so those the, the other name would be Albert Pujols, who's, who's just a, you know, Kurt Warner, two guys with very heavy faith, two guys with that, that really, I think, go about being... Uh, professional athletes. And then after that public figures that really try to do and make a difference in people's lives uh, with whether it's Albert working with, uh, with kids with down syndrome, or it's uh, it's Kurt Warner, who, who I think is the most genuine, authentic person who, you know, has been very open about his faith, but also lives it and, and really treats people that way. So I mean, I could go on and on and on, and I already have. But I, I think, you know, there's some special people that I've gotten to meet. You're certainly one of them, Tim. And and I can just tell, you know, with my interaction with Troy, you know, you've 
you've done well. And, and, and I hope that you have some inner peace knowing that not only have you made a difference in people's lives, but it just goes, trickles down, you know, after you with these great kids that you've raised and, and, you know, good for you. You've, you've, you've done well. Joe, do you think that there's, when you're interviewing somebody and you get those reactions, like you, like you mentioned, they kind of have to be, they have to do their part of the dance, right? They have to be willing to, to be vulnerable or to give the honest answers. Do you think it's more of a, you got to catch them on the right day, the right, almost like timing? Or do you think it's, it's, um, you know, can you ask, can you go into a difficult interview and maybe ask the question that breaks the shell or breaks that glass and, and opens it up? That's, that's the key. I, I think, I mean, it's, you know, Dennis Rodman was another guy, wild and crazy and all that stuff. And yet he came out and sat down on the stage. And I said, my guest tonight's Dennis Rodman. I went through his little resume, took 15 seconds. He started talking. People gave him a standing ovation. He couldn't talk. I mean, he was a very emotional guy. He's, I mean, he's been through a lot and he's brought some, a lot of it on himself and all that stuff. But yeah, you don't know what you're getting anytime you sit down across from somebody. And I think it's always interesting. You know, my wife does more interviewing now these days than I do. And we always talk before she heads off to interview whoever, the defensive end for the Vikings or the quarterback of the 49ers or whoever. And it's those first few questions that I think set the tone for what kind of an interview it's going to be. And I, I think you're sending out signals just like they are. And so it's hard, you know, we all now live in a Zoom world after the pandemic where everybody still does these things and there's not a whole lot of person to person touch or being in the same room. But it's a lot easier when you can interact and they're right there and you can kind of give them a warmth like I'm not here to embarrass you. I'm not here to get any gotcha moments. I just want to talk. I want to learn about who you are. I want to I want to I want to know what makes you excited to get out of bed in the morning or, you know, what your low points were and, and you know, know, know that this is a safe place to talk. So I, I think sometimes for sure, I mean, you could get anybody on the wrong day and, and they're not going to be willing to talk. But I think if you do it right and you let that person know initially in an interview, you know, this this is something that uh Hopefully, when it's done, you'll want to show other people and your family or whatever that that this is who you are. And, you know, I, th I think that goes a long way. So I, I think setting the tone early in an interview is is vitally important. Thank you, Joe, for the kind words. Well, I don't know if you're going to go more. I, I just I just think as I get, have gotten older. Yeah, you know, I realize that we're all dealing with stuff, but I, I just, you know, I, I just have known from the minute we sat at Denny's Tim, that, that you were kind of cut from a different cloth in the best possible way and, and just tireless and somebody that, you know, is, it would get over any hurdle that was put in front of them. And I know this is the biggest hurdle that pretty much anybody could ever have to get over, but I also don't know anybody better equipped to get over the hurdle and, and to make the most of, of whatever situation that they're in. And, you know, you're, you're just surrounded by love. And I know you get as much, uh, I know you get as much from your family as they get from you. And that's, that's saying a lot because I, I, I can only imagine the kind of love that, that exists in the greenhouse. And and you got your kid living right next door to you, which is a testament to what he actually feels about you. Most kids can't wait to get away from mom and dad, and and he's right there. We've got Joe. We've got on one lane. It's me and my older brother, and right across the street is my older sister. So within a two minute walk is, and then my younger brother's still at my parents' house. He's still in high school. Oh my God! Let him up for God's sake! Let I mean. Only that was my dad's away. joke. He's, I remember my dad uh, with his buddies, like, uh, what's that kid of yours doing? And his friend said, oh, he's living at home while he works, uh, while he works at the law firm or whatever he was doing. And my dad said, he's just waiting for you to grow up and get a place of your own, which is like <laughs> what happens. I mean, at some point, come on, Troy, move. Where are you guys still in Scanny Atlas or? Yeah, that's right. Good yeah, God. Somewhere. 
<laughs> you know, I went hunting with your dad. Remember when you took me hunting with Scott Conjol <laughs> and Scott K Ca- is Scott Case? Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Um and it was the it was the most I've ever been out of my element in my life. I'm saying, first of all, I mean, if you're going to go hunting, that's where you want to do it because it was like at this crazy lodge and it was a blast. We had a great time. Uh, but I was like the goofy little guy that everybody was just ragging on the whole time. I didn't even know how to put my pants on, let alone fire a weapon and try and hunt something. And I remember we got out. I, I remember like it was yesterday and it's like, uh, yeah, today we're going to, we're going to hunt wild boar. Like, <laughs> Uh, okay and it was like you know if one's coming at you i'm like wait start over if one's coming at me one's coming at you you know you should don't don't miss because those things are really nasty i'm like what what the hell is happening right now but i i was a it's my one and done i've climbed one mountain kilimanjaro i did that with my daughter and I've gone hunting once, and that was with Tim Green and his band of merry friends. <laughs> that's a good. Those are that's a good one and done. If you're going to do it once, that's a good. Well, I mean, it's, you know, people would at an auction for somebody who actually hunted for, a, for and enjoyed it. I don't know what you could get for the kind of trip that your dad uh, provided for me. But yeah, I was like, this is great. Can we leave now? We're like up at. <laughs> four in the morning going floaty fishing and shooting at geese and i i just like i they have a, they have a movie theater <laughs> nearby here i'll go there and you guys can keep hunting <laughs> would you do me a favor i believe mark brunel is on the lions coaching staff if you see him next season would you please tell him my story and thank him for me yes my god yes are you kidding me he'll be i Yes, now I can't wait to see Mark Brunel um, and and talk to him about this because I, I think it will it'll give him a lot of uh, it'll give him a, a lot of good feelings knowing that that he made a difference. About three years ago, you had the scare of a lifetime. Can you recount what happened and describe your state of mind? You mean with my voice? Yeah, yeah. Um, I yeah I. It was a weird year. It was 2011, so it's a long, it's a longer time ago than that. But I, I had gone in. See this beautiful hair that you see. I'd gone in for my uh, eighth hair transplant surgery. And one thing when you go on, I, so I'd done the first six, where you do it and you're awake, and they're taking. This has all been advanced since then, but they're taking a strip of hair out of the back put the little follicles in the front of your head and out the door you go. Well, then it was so painful. The doctor's like, you know, you can do this under general anesthetic. I was like, it's going to cost you a little more money. I said, I don't care what it costs. I'm not doing this awake anymore. So they put, they put me under and what you, you know, whenever anybody puts a waiver in front of you, you're like, okay, whatever. You sign it and you don't even read the thing. Well, I think on any waiver, I could be wrong, but I I don't think I am. If you get intubated, and which they obviously need an airway if they're going to put you under in case something goes wrong, that you can have damage to the nerves that fire your vocal cords. So I go under and I come out and I'm already in pain from the hair transplant surgery and I come out and I'm talking like this. And uh, I talked to my sister and my mom, like, I don't know what's going on. I can't really, I can't really get this out of my voice. Anyway, three days, four days, still sound like that. And I go back to the dire, I go to an ENT doctor and they're like, oh yeah, I, I know what you have, but I'm going to look at it anyway. And I'm like, okay. Puts the thing down my throat. He goes, you have a paralyzed vocal cord. I was like, sorry, what? And I said, uh, a pa- he goes, paralyzed vocal cord. I said, well, how long does that last? And he goes, well, it could be, it could come back in three days or three weeks or three months or never. I was like, are you kidding me? So it, it was, it was as low 
you know, I, I mean, it's embarrassing even talking about this with, with what you, you deal with every day, but I, I was, I was going through a divorce. I, uh, was going through what I thought was the end of my career because I, you're waiting on a nerve to heal and you don't know if it ever will all for a stupid, uh, what's the word? Stupid, like, uh, beautifying, dumb elective surgery that doesn't mean anything to anybody. I'm like, this is the greatest joke of all time. Uh, I'm, I'm going for hair transplant surgery. The joke I've told and, and or the story I've told is I saw Matthew McConaughey at this place and I was kind of fishing around with him and I was talking like this. He's like, what happened? What happened to your voice there, buckaroo? And I said, uh, I told him the story. I'm like, well, I went in for a hair transplant surgery and I came out, I came out and I talked like, you know, they say it could come back. And if it doesn't, then they can put some Gore-Tex in there and fix it. And, and he, he just stops and he's like, so what you're saying there, buckaroo, is you fixed your video and effed up your audio. <laughs> I was like, yeah, that's exactly, that's exact. thank you, Matthew. That's exactly what happened. And uh, yeah, I'm actually on antidepressants now. And uh, yeah, it's it's been a blast. But, you know, eventually it came back, but it didn't have to. Um, and it took nine months, eight months. And so I went through an entire season of baseball sounding not good. And, and I went on uh, Jimmy Fallon's Tonight Show and, I can't, if I Google it, it's from like 2011. I was getting ready to do the all-star game and I thought I, I pulled it off and I came off the stage after doing the tonight show. Like, Oh my God, that, you know, i I tricked everybody. I've sounded fine. And now I listen to it now. And I'm like, Oh my God, it sounded awful. And then I did the, the all-star game like that. And what happens is when half your, you can't close one vocal cord, all your air comes out. So you can't really emote. You can't get loud. You can't. And it, it was, it was a rough year. And and you asked, you know, how scared I was. I, I was beyond scared. I don't even know what, what comes after that. I, but I was a mess and, you know, you really find out um, when you're in that position and, you know, I'm telling you, but who is in your tent who's in your circle and who's there to pump you up and who's there to kind of keep sowing some doubt into your mind and you know you know steve horn who who's worked with me forever he was he was an unbelievable unbelievable uh ally throughout that whole thing um pumping me up before every broadcast i was scared to death every time i went on the air that i would i i couldn't do it and so i went from it was the first time i went from worrying about what I was going to say to worrying about if I could say it and if it would come out and if you could hear it and if it would. So when it came back and it came back in October, like between games one and two of the world series that year. And that was the year that David freeze, that would have been another one that I would have mentioned. Troy David freeze hit a game winning uh, home run in the 11th inning of game six. And you can still kind of hear it. I can because I know my voice, but it had just come back. And I call this home run. I do a knockoff of my dad's call of we'll see you tomorrow night. And, uh, and I won the Emmy for that year, which I literally won an Emmy for one call. And it was a call that wasn't even original. I did a rip off of my dad's call that happened 20 years earlier. Otherwise the rest of the year, was not only not Emmy worthy, I probably should have lost my job. But Fox and David Hill, who we worked for, David Hill said, I don't care if your voice comes back in a year. You're going to have a job. So don't worry about it. Relax. It was the greatest gift that any boss could ever give me. But I, I was I was a disaster um, that year on the air and, and in my personal life. When, when your voice came back, I, I've never heard of anyone dealing with that is it a sudden thing all of a sudden one day you wake up and it's back all of a sudden one day you wake up and you're like <clears throat> well i'm making a louder sound i'm making uh I'm, I'm giving less effort because they're starting the vocal cords are starting to close a little bit better 
Um, but it's still not a hundred percent. I mean, it's, it's still not what it was when Tim and I worked together, but it's good enough. And, and it's, you know, you realize it's not always how you sound. It's, it's more about what you say, when you say it, there's, there's a lot of stuff that goes into it, but it's a gradual thing. And, um, I had a lot of great doctors, a, a guy in Boston, Steven Zytels, who helped me through it. Um, but yeah, it's a good question. I think it's one of those things where you just realize that you're making less effort than you did the day before. And then the next day you make less effort than you did that day to make a loud sound. That That's about the only way that I can describe it. it, it so it, no, it's not like, bang, it's back. It's just, it gets better. Yeah. If, if uh, thankfully it did and, and you're able to, you know, live, live your, your dreams, your current life out. But if that had happened and, and you weren't able to announce, what do you think you would be doing? Well, I mean, my, my fallback answer and something I still want to do is teach, um, teach broadcasting, teach and, and try to impart what I was so fortunate to learn as a kid two young people coming up in this business and it's so much more and, and so much of a bigger business than it was when I started in broadcasting. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, schools have unbelievable facilities now, their own radio and TV stations. They have the means to have kids actually go do play by play, go do radio shows, go do whatever it is, but I'd love to teach. But if my voice was messed up, I don't know that I could have done that. So um, I, I think I probably could have gotten to a point where teaching would have been a possibility. Um, maybe talk show kind of stuff, which sounds nuts if you if you feel like you can't talk right. But I think they could have done enough to bolster or fortify my voice without me having to yell, scream, and get loud over a crowd where I could have sat in front of a microphone like this, turned it way up, and it would have been fine. But yeah, I I don't know. I. It, it never got to the point where it's like, man, I need to really think about what's next here. But um, I wasn't too far away from that point. I've always said that the more successful you are, the bigger the target on your back. You are wildly successful. I read that a few years ago, you had what turned out to be a friendly exchange with someone who was critical of you on Twitter. Was that a successful experiment or did you decide simply that the people that know me like Tim know that I am a nice, kind, down to earth guy and that's all that matters. Yeah, I, I think, I think it's that I, I think, and it's hard for me because I'm a pleaser and I know that, I mean, my book was called lucky bastard. I, I know that I am lucky with everything that I was handed um, as a kid. It was like a master's class every night, but I did take advantage of it and I did work hard and I do try to treat people the right way. And, and that's gotta be enough. I, I can't, you know, you open yourself up to the public and no matter what you say, probably now more than ever, you're going to have a lot of people who don't like it. And, and if you want to go through life, just making, trying to make everybody love you. First of all, that's never going to happen. And secondly, you're never really going to have an opinion uh, because anytime you have an opinion, it's, it's off putting to somebody and you have to live with that. So I, I think by the way you asked it, Tim, you know, my answer. And, and I think social media can be a good thing. Social media can get the word out about different situations or fundraisers or whatever it might be. But social media, it, when kids ask me, you know, what, what, what's your advice to somebody getting into this business? My, my part of my answer, and it's a long answer, is turn off social media. Find three or four people whose opinion you trust. Do your work. Get on the air. Have those three or four people give you honest feedback. And go from there. Don't open yourself up to Twitter and people who aren't doing it. And and try to get your sense of self worth from that. You, you have to be better and bigger than that. And you know, I it, it's easy to say, it's hard to do. Um, and everybody that loves me when I'm going through a World Series, uh, which I don't have to do anymore or get to do anymore, it's always like forget all that. You're doing a great job. You can't worry about all that. And it's just, I think they get as tired of pumping me up as I am of reading about the stuff of, yeah, oh, you suck. You, 
good thing you had a famous father. Oh, you, but that's just, that's just human nature. And you have to kind of chalk it up to that. And also there are a lot of fans that are mad. Their team just lost. And I'm the guy telling in the world that their team just lost. And, you know, big deal. Uh, they, they'll turn their ire on the next person. We spoke to Brian Kilmeade not that long ago from from Fox News, and he said the biggest turning point, or one of the biggest turning points in his career, is when he stopped listening to all the noise. He just—it's actually eerily similar to what you just said. Yeah, so well, said. I used to have it, Troy. Is this is how dumb I am? I, I would have it open sometimes when I was doing a game. I always remember I was doing a Phillies game one time, and I I, I left it on and. I'm like basically interacting with people on my phone while I'm doing the game and reading them ripping me to my Twitter account while I'm doing the game and almost falling into that same trap of trying to prove that I'm not doing what they're saying I'm doing. But the funny thing is, many times, this is not like a one time or twice this happened, many times, I wasn't even doing the game. And I would have people tweeting at me, you suck. He was safe. And I'm like in a hotel room in (laughs) Omaha. And I'm like, I I would get back and be like, I don't know what game you're watching, um, but that's Kenny Albert. And he and I don't sound at all alike. So (laughs) yell at Kenny. Cause, uh, and I don't know if he was safe or out. Cause I'm not watching. I'm not even doing the game. So you realize it's just, it's almost impersonal, as weird as that sounds. It's almost like people just want to rail. They want to throw junk. They want to be mad. They want to say it. They want to somehow that makes them feel better. And I'm sure it's the same for Brian, you know, when, especially in politics. I mean, when you get into talking about political situations and candidates and everything else, and there's going to be a segment of the population that is not going to agree with you. And they're going to try to be as mean as they can be because they want people to retweet it. And they want it. They want their little moment of fame. The funny thing is what happens is the minute you engage with them or the second you engage and you go, Hey, uh, yeah, have a great day. Uh, you know, you're wrong by that, uh, you know, with your opinion. And by the way, that's not how you spell there in this situation. Uh, the minute you do that, they're like, uh, <laughs> they're like, oh, hey, uh, yeah, no, I didn't really mean it. Uh, you know, you do a good job, but, and that's, I don't, that's, that's my Twitter, that's my Twitter hater guy voice. <laughs> oh, hey, you know, you didn't really, I don't really, and then you go, oh, why am I even doing this? I, I look like a fool, but you know, it's like, learn how to spell two. T O O means also, not T O. And yet I, here I am arguing with this moron about if, if he, if he, if he thinks I don't like his team, I don't even care about his team. <laughs> We've lost your dad now for about the yeah. next three minutes. He liked the he there liked. thing. That's the hardest <laughs> thing for people on Twitter. They, they can figure anything else out on Twitter. And now the owner, he can build electric cars but they can't figure out an algorithm to put the proper version of there into a sentence on Twitter. <laughs> can't do it. <laughs> he literally asked to write the tears. <laughs> That's great. Well, good. I made Tim green laugh. I, I made him cry, <laughs> made him laugh and cry in the same sentence. Speaking of people that misunderstand you, and I know that these people willfully misunderstood you, and I bet you know what I'm going to say. You're completely innocuous, innocent, and I would go so far as to say wholesome comment about the Super Bowl has to be the farthest reaching quote that you ever had. Would you categorize that as fake news? Yeah, I mean, what Tim is referring to is prior to the Super Bowl, I went on my friend's radio station here in St. Louis and they're like, are you going to go to Vegas for the Super Bowl? And because I was, and I don't know what I can or cannot say on this podcast, but because I was, okay, well, because I was on a regular radio station, like an over the air radio station, they said, you know, well, how do you think it's going to be in Vegas? What I wanted to say was the phrase shit show, but I couldn't say it. Because it was normal and I wouldn't do that on regular radio in St. Louis. And by the way, I like a shit show just like anybody else. It's my point was, and I think of it when I do these interviews, I'm always assuming they're asking me 
what it would be like if I'm doing the game. And I can only tell you, I've done Super Bowls in Jacksonville, New, uh, well, I've done one in New York, Houston, Miami, uh, Arizona. And you've got this spectacle of the Super Bowl and, and so much is going on. And when you're doing Miami, I don't know if I said Miami, but, uh, when you're doing it, it's like, I got, I got to get to work. Like I've, I've, I'm there to work. And so it's hard when you've got party, 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 and everybody's there and they're having a great time and the lobby's jammed with people and it's loud and you can't go to sleep because there's noise. That was my point. I was talking about, and, and from all accounts, it was a smashing success. But my point was, it's just going to be a lot of people in a small area. God love them. They did an unbelievable job. And so when that, that quote like took on a life of its own, I reached out to Roger Goodell. I reached out to my bosses at ESPN. I said, first of all, I'm an idiot because that's not how I meant it. Secondly, I'm sorry that this becomes like a, a negative for what should be an unbelievable week. And, and, and they were, everybody's like, no, come on. We know what you're talking about, that it's just going to be, it's going to be intense. It's Vegas. That's why they have it there. I mean, they could have it in Des Moines, but that's probably not going to get the same kind of crowd as it would in Vegas or LA or New York or so that, that was it. And, and nobody of posi- in positions of power in my life cared about it, but I don't like reading that stuff like that. I'm being critical of something when I really wasn't, I was trying to say, it's just going to be wild. And the older I get, wild is not something that I'm usually looking for. So that was kind of my point, trying to be tongue in cheek. But, you know, that's 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 how these shows go. So you go on a friend's radio station and then they clip it and they send it because they want clicks. And it's five seconds out of a 20 minute interview and it becomes kind of out of context and kind of not in the same spirit that it was said, but you know, that was dumb me. And, and that's just the way it goes. Joe, it's been an extreme pleasure to catch up with you, my brother. I can't tell you how much this means to Troy and I may God continue to bless you and your family. It's been more of a joy for me and it's great being me to see father and son work together and, and to see, you know, the smiles you two share and, and the way you each pick up for one another. It's, it's just awesome. So just know that you live in my heart and you're a huge part of my life. Uh, and I vow to do a better job of staying in touch you and I texted very random times. Uh, but we will continue to do so and know that I was uh, honored to be asked and I'm here for anything you guys ever need. And congrats on all the success that that you get to share in with your kids uh, because it's it's really awesome to see. Joe, one question before we wrap up. One of the things we try to do is really just like having interesting conversations, with interesting people. And my dad's kind of walked in a lot of different uh, different lives, right, with his books and football and announcing and all that so we've had a really cool like diverse group of people that we've talked to so i ask everybody at the end if if there's somebody that you think that we should talk to and help get their story out there who has a really particularly interesting story um who's somebody you think we should try to get on to try and get on the uh podcast well i mean you haven't had mark brunel on have you no. Well, I, I would start with him. I th- that yeah, that'll be your dad's favorite guest. Uh it he'll he'll put everybody else to shame. Um <laughs> but there are I will text your dad as I as I think about this going forward because there are I think some really great stories out there that need to be told and need to have people hear because I, I don't think anybody disagrees with this, that that everybody seems so segmented and so isolated. And, you know, the uplifting stories are the ones that just unite. And and that's kind of the beauty of sports, too. I, I it's it's corny. It's cliche. But when you go to when we go to the Blues game on Saturday and I bring my boys and you're we're sitting in seats 
and the Blues score a goal. If they win a game in overtime, or we got to have the thrill. They they weren't aware enough at the point, but they won the Stanley Cup. And you're there high fiving people all because you you all want the same thing. You all you all rooting for the same team and you're high fiving people in the seats you don't know. I mean, I don't know anybody's yeah. political beliefs two rows over or you're reaching over and high fiving people. I don't know what their religion is. I don't care what it's just it's a unifying thing. So I, I think with your story and what you guys bring to the table, add sports into the mix. I I think you know the world is your oyster in this in this category, and and I, I vow to think of a great list, which I will text Tim, and and hopefully share with you. But I, if you don't get Mark Brunel, I then I consider you guys both failures. <laughs> I agree. Then you then then Tim has no pull. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, that that's that's definitely the and if you need getting I, help uh, getting to them i i'm happy to to bridge the gap definitely yeah after this i'll i'll uh i'll call you or text you and definitely that'd be great all right i never heard that story joe till right now that's that's the first time i've ever heard it so that's interesting really I've never heard of it. yeah yeah i never when he was telling that story that's why i was like i was listening so intently because i was like i never heard that so when he said mark brunell I, th- I thought you were going to say you had a bad interview, and, I, and I've only ever heard great things about him. Oh, so he's like, a great oh. guy. I can't act like I know him that well. I, we didn't do a bunch of his games when he was a player. I know him more more as a coach, you know. Just but but even that is kind of yeah. at arm's length. So I get him, and then we'll go from there. But that I, I want to listen to that. Awesome! Thanks so much, Joe, for making the time and, and telling the stories and. All right, boys. I'll uh, I'll stay in touch. All right, thank you. All right, see you guys. Barkley Damon LLP is proud to be the law firm sponsor of Tim Green's podcast, Nothing Left Unsaid. For more on Barkley Damon's team of nearly 300 attorneys with regional, national, and global reach from our offices across the northeastern U.S., Washington, D.C., and Toronto, go to Barkley Damon. I want to thank my partners at Barkley Damon for supporting this podcast and of course Eleven Labs for their incredible technology. If you like today's episode, a free way to support the podcast is to subscribe and share it with friends. Thank you. A significant amount of these sponsorships go to TackleALS.com for cutting edge ALS research at Massachusetts General Hospital. If you want to make a contribution, go to TackleALS.com. Dot com.